but it was yeah it was it was exciting but it was a little scary too because it's like okay well what what is this we're trying to make something that's our own and has a has a like a bespoke look to it but that's hard it's it's hard to do that sometimes because there has been just so much visual content over the past 10 20 years um it's really hard to do something new and fresh you're so influenced by everything around you and you're you're like inundated with so much great stuff too um so that was a process and that was you know that wasn't easy to start to kind of develop our own look and you could obviously see influences but every every movie every video game every piece of content is influenced by something else but we are really trying our best to kind of create something new and fresh an incredible guest joins us for today's episode therefore i'm delighted to welcome industry legend james klein james has graced many of cinema's most iconic ips to name a few he's worked on several steven spielberg projects starting with minority report which came about early in his career created for the star wars universe worked with james cameron on avatar countless others and more recently was seen spearheading the impeccable work on Gareth Edwards' The Creator as production designer. James's passion for design and artistry is constant, yet his journey was not straightforward and saw him work a multitude of roles before he found his calling. So sit back and get ready to dive into the creative mind and life of James and discover how he forged a formidable career, how he ended up chilling at Sid Mead's house, what he spoke about in a pub with Gareth Edwards, and what it was like working on The Creator, plus much more. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast, and I'm delighted to welcome one of very special guests and the legend, James Klein. Welcome, James. Oh, legend. You just threw that in there. Just threw it in there. <laughs> um, how's it going? Good. Yeah, good, man. It's, um, it's been really busy, which is not a bad thing, certainly in, in an industry mm-hmm. that sometimes gets a little crazy. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't get so busy and you start to worry, mm-hmm. but right now it's mm-hmm. busy, which is, it's good. It's a good thing. Cool. Cool. Um, so before we get into all the good stuff, if you wouldn't mind just letting our guests know, um, we have a lot of students that jump on sometimes for the first time, sometimes they're very, new to the industry and just fresh about everything. So if you wouldn't mind just letting them know who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm, my name is James Klein. Um, I am currently a production designer in the film industry, um, but I've been in the film industry for, my God, I'd hate to even say it, a little bit over 22 years now. Um, even more, God, maybe it's even 24 years. <laughs> oh, my God, time really passes. So I came up through kind of the ranks of more of a kind of concept art illustrator um, path, which means, you know, uh, I typically would work in an art department on a film for anywhere from six months to like up to like three years. And um, yeah, I, I kind of provide visuals for films. I work with the the kind of the head of that department, which would be called the production designer. And, um, it's, it's kind of exciting because I work on anything from, I work mostly on sci-fi to be honest, but Mm -hmm. once in a while I get to work on like a historical drama or, or a comedy or something. So somebody who has a little bit of ADHD, I get to kind of, you know, jump into all kinds of different genres and Mm -hmm. things. Um, but yeah, uh, in the past couple of years I've been, uh, production designing which again is kind of heading up the art department and got a bunch of more responsibilities and budget and scheduling and all that stuff but it still is a very kind of a creative position um with just a lot more responsibility cool this career that you've had was it a part of the plan or something that you fell into the current where i'm currently at um like, yeah, i guess like working in the film industry overall like was that like a dream for you like, is that something that you wanted to do you know to be honest it, it wasn't uh i okay. went to school i went to a design school art center in pasadena um primarily initially for 
like automotive design. Like I thought, Ooh, maybe I'll become an automotive designer. That'd be cool. Um, and I kind of got halfway through and I was like, Oh, do I want to design and work on one car for like six, seven years and just work on the taillight or something? I just didn't have the patience maybe for it. So I, I started taking other classes like film classes and uh, product design classes. And uh, one of my instructors, he <clears throat> snuck me on to the lot uh, at Warner Brothers um, and uh, showed me an art department. I, I just saw all the stuff guys were creating, like cities and uh, vehicles and props and all this stuff. I just couldn't, I didn't even know that really even existed, yeah. to be honest. Um, so I just got the bug after that and then tried my best to weasel my way in. And I started by doing storyboards. I worked for Activision for a year. I worked for a visual effects company for a year uh, and eventually kind of found my way into the kind of art department uh, track. But yeah, initially that was not part of the plan at all. Awesome. Um Similar path, although nowhere near as an illustrious career as yourself. I went to university in automotive design as well. And oh, almost no the same same journey <laughs> happened as well. I was like, yeah, the whole, as you described it perfectly, that design taillights is not really, you know, like, I guess, titillating my taste buds. And then when I discovered entertainment design and that that could be done, that's when it was like, well, this is this is super duper cool. But so what was that you, like? For, yeah. Did you actually do automotive design, or was it just yeah, something? Yeah, I, 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 I finished the course. I, um, when I was like ten years old, I thought I wanted to be a car designer, so that's all I hunted for. I right. did automotive design at Coventry Uni, and then in the second or third year, I kind of knew that okay, this isn't really what a probably I'm not good at or what I want to do. And then I think on the right. placement year, it, it was more like um less automotive, more concept art, um, entertainment design thing. And that's yeah. where, like, I really shine. I think my face lit up, like, I guess, figuratively, literally then. And I was like, okay, this is definitely my calling. Um, yeah. And a few people I've spoken to who've kind of done that industrial design, automotive design route, like yourself and myself, have kind of had that same kind of, like, journey and path. Um, so it's interesting that there's, like, I guess, a, a, a breed of us, a species of us that have kind of gone that way and then ended I up love that. In, in the yeah, industry. I, love um, that. I know, you know, I've, <laughs> I've got a few friends that have gone that way. And I mean, I'm old enough to where at art center, there was no entertainment design track. Mm -hmm. Like it hadn't even started yet. There was yes. just industrial design and, um, and that was kind of it. And my kind of senior project, I, I did this kind of Russian avant-garde, um, monolithic city kind of thing people thought i was crazy because <laughs> you just didn't do that kind of thing yeah. um in school but soon after a few years after that they started to do a, a build out a, a entertainment track but yeah I, the guys that come from automotive there, there's a certain look and feel that certainly um you know you can see you can kind of understand a little bit if, if they've mm -hmm. had a little bit of that pedigree mm. Yeah, I mean, but for yourself, like, did you, I guess, like, before even that, like, what led you to go down that route? Was it just a case of that was kind of the closest thing that aligned to what you wanted to do? Or like, what made, what led you down towards the automotive, I guess, slash industrial design route? Education. Yeah, I mean, um, I was in high school and I always loved to draw. I've, ever since I was a kid, I would just draw and you know, I'd probably doodle too much in school and get in trouble for it. And uh, I would do drawings for people and friends yes. and for girls. And um, and then um, I, I think my second year in high school, maybe third year in high school, a representative from Art Center came down. I lived about an hour, two hours south of L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, in Art Centers in L.A., she drove down and gave this whole slide presentation of what art center was. And it just like blew my mind. I was like, what? Cause at the time I was drawing, like I was into like drawing like Michelangelo or right. who knows, like, you know, surfers or <clears throat> just random stuff. I didn't know like there was a profession behind any of it. Uh -huh. um, 
So based on that, a friend of mine who was in the art class with me was also like equally like just kind of blown away. We took a, it was called Saturday High. It was a class that they offered to high school level kids um, every Saturday for about six weeks. So we carpooled up back and forth and it was just like, this is amazing. It's like a school full of like, like-minded people. Um, and then we kind of built our portfolio after that. Um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, go to art center right away after high school. I kind of wanted right. to get my liberal arts education. I kind of screwed around at a, at a couple schools where I just surfed a lot and, you know, partied probably too much, but I kind of wanted that experience. Um, but after a couple of years of that, I got really tired of it and I was like, well, maybe now's okay. the time to go to art center. And I kind of put my portfolio together and I got in and, um, yeah, that, the rest is history kind of, uh, but yeah, it was all came down to that one person who came down and mm -hmm. kind of presented, this is what this, I mean, without that, I would have never probably known about it. Um, wow. so yeah. What do you think you'd be doing then instead? <laughs> oh man i don't know i can't do anything else so <laughs> sick who knows man <laughs> anything um, to, yeah who knows what was building that portfolio like was it a smooth process or was it a bunch of up and down? like did you have a lot of insecurity about putting together a portfolio to get into art center like what was the process like to like did you was you aware of like the kind of standard that it needed to be um, or was you had a different yeah, I mean, together? I, I mean, I was terrified because I heard mm -hmm. that, you know, it wasn't easy to get in and they only take a certain amount of students every year or every semester. Um, but because I had that Saturday high class, that six week course or whatever it was, uh, I kind of just built the the whole portfolio off of that. And I just kept all those drawings and illustrations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I think it certainly helped because it gave me a little bit of like a window inside the process and somebody appreciated, somebody appreciated it. So yeah, I, if, if I hadn't had that, I don't know what, I mean, again, it would have been like s doodles and sketches of yeah. just about anything, but what, what was for the courses. So it really helped me kind of understand what they were looking for, for sure. What was in your portfolio at the time? Oh man, a bunch of bad artwork, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, we had to draw. We had to design like a can opener, <laughs> like those. I don't even know if they have them today. Like it's just like mm -hmm. an automatic can opener for like metal cans. Um, I don't think we had any cars. I think it was more of like product design. Yeah. Um, but it taught you how to use, like at the time, it was like all markers on vellum. Yes. Um, that kind of old school marker, vellum, uh, charcoal uh, kind of way. I mean, back then, yeah. there weren't any real like computer uh, classes. When uh -huh. I finally went to Art Center, they had these silicon graphics uh, courses. Um, where we were learning how to design kind of exterior of cars in 3d, but I hated it. It was so, mm. it, was, it was all spline based. It was really difficult to wrap your head around, at least for me, yeah. you go into that computer lab for like 10 hours and come out with like the worst looking thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the portfolio, God, I wonder if I still have stuff from it. I don't know, but it was all very kind of product designed based yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I also had similar experiences with, <clears throat> I guess, digital and 3D for the first time, um, which is ironic considering now, like the whole is completely inverted, like in terms of the tools that we use. Yeah. Uh, I remember not, not fancy in Photoshop. Um, and then what I had to use first was Alias for NURBS modeling and stuff. And that, I remember well, that's what it was. It was Alias. Okay. Yeah. NURB, NURB based Alias yes. stuff. Oh man, I hated that stuff. Oh. Did you ever get used to it or is it still? No, the, I hey, never books? got used to it. I mean, I know 3D now and I mm -hmm. use, um, you know, Luxology Moto, which is an yeah. old kind of tool that's still hanging around. But um, 
and I and I love 3D as part of the process. But back yes. then, Alias, I don't know. I, and there were some guys that, that did it fairly well, that, that yes. really kind yes. of understood it. But it wasn't me. I I could not get it down. I took an animation class w- using Alias, and I kind of enjoyed that. Uh, everybody was doing like, you know, animated car doors or something, and yeah. I did a, I did a scary like rusty old amusement park ride with a clown head that reared up and blew fire all over the the passengers on this like rocket nice. kind of thing, <laughs> I'm, kind of freaked people out. But uh, that was kind of fun. But um, I was trying to do more like. At that time, I was trying to do less cars and I was trying to do other stuff like set design or like mm-hmm. building or architecture or something. But, um, yeah, it was it was no it was no fun. It was really hard to kind of <laughs> use that tool. Um, what was making you do those kind of projects? Was it like just personal interest or was it a bit of rebelliousness against the syllabus that you were told to do? It was a little bit of rebellion. And I had to go to the dean and say, hey, okay. I don't really want to do cars, but I also don't want to do can openers and tennis shoes. Um, this is kind of what I want to do. And fortunately, he was, he was pretty cool to, and supported me on kind of taking other classes like film classes and, yeah. um, and just – but at the same time trying – because transportation design at the time – had some of the best, still had some of the best classes. Mm -hmm. So he allowed me to still take some of those classes. Um, But it was mostly rebellion because once I got a sneak peek into how they make movies, that's all I wanted Mm -hmm. to do. I almost, I almost dropped out of art center for that very reason. I was like, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go right into the film industry if I can, but I'm glad Mm -hmm. I stuck with it. But now, of course, it's all completely different. They have like mm-hmm. a full entertainment design track and um, all that stuff. But at the time, I had to kind of just convince people to let me do it a certain way. And once you, I guess, got that taste on on that glimpse of like what the, how the film industry works or the stuff that you could kind of do, has it been no turning back since? Have you like had different kind of like maybe points where you thought, let's try something else? or once you got the bitten by that bug of working in films, it's been there since. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been pretty, been pretty happy about, you know, and feeling really lucky that I'm able to, that I've been able to be in this industry for so long. Um, cause it can't, it, it, sometimes it, it's really hard. It's like, uh, you know, you're kind of, mostly you're kind of a freelancer. I work for, mm-hmm. Lucasfilm ILM for 10 years and I was on staff. So that was a little different, but other than that, I was, you know, freelance. So you kind of have to, you kind of have to find your own way. Um, and, and I've, I've picked up little projects here and there working for architectural firms or Mm -hmm. working on some video game projects. But, um, but most of it has been focused on, on film. Um, Mm -hmm. I love the art of film. I love the, there's an emotive quality behind it when you sit in a dark room for two hours and you know, there, there's nothing more right now for me, there's nothing more immersive to be honest. It's still, it's still an art form that, you know, really kind of moves you emotionally. And, and I like to be a part of that. Totally agree. Um, Regarding, like, I guess watching films there, obviously we've got, like, you know, Netflix, a lot of on-demand stuff now. Do you notice a big difference watching, especially a film that you like, like watching it on TV versus in theatres? Like, do you not have a noticeable difference? I mean, the quality of of watching something on television obviously has, has progressed um, in the past several years. Um, I mean, I don't have a 4K TV, but... Um, you know, the, the, the resolution on TVs are amazing Mm -hmm. and they get quite large. Um, I still like going to the movie theaters as much as I can. Um, I tried to take my kids and family Mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, cause it's just, it, there's, there's something different about going to a movie theater. I'm going to sound like a super old fart here, but, um, (laughs) 
there's something about being, it's communal. You're with other people and you're not necessarily talking to them, but you're kind of, uh, you're reacting the same way, whether something scares you or it's just kind of cool and awe inspiring or it's, um, you know, it's sad or, or heartbreaking. Like you're all, you're in a room with a bunch of strangers kind of feeling the same way. And Mm -hmm. that's just not the same at home. Um, so I like that experience a lot. Um, and I think other people do too. I think people like feeling that way. And listen, I, I hope there's still a world where there's, there's both of those that, you know, Mm -hmm. we still have healthy, you know, industry in both like streaming and, and Mm -hmm. movie theaters themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Like I am totally appreciative of, I guess the technology that we have now where we can access all of this content in different forms. Um, but I am one of those annoying friends, even sometimes strangers, a stranger to people that I never met saying, you need to watch this in the theaters. You need to watch this <laughs> with the, you know, as loud as possible. Um, nothing saddens me more just, just from my, you know, just being a nerd, for example, like just people watching something on their phone, but I get the convenience behind it as well. I used to work in sales. We only had like half an hour breaks stuck in a little corner and that's when people used to really like unwind and watch yeah. their show or catch up on their show for that. But I'm like, you got to watch this in the cinemas. Um, however, I also know that people probably wouldn't watch half of this stuff if it wasn't accessible for them. Um, yeah, but totally. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember trying to convince people just to watch Avatar. The first thing I saw in IMAX was Avatar and, um, I remember telling my friends, like, you have to watch it, you have to watch it, you have to watch it. Like, oh, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Obviously, I think I watched it four or five times in IMAX just to escort people there so they could watch it as well, just to experience right. it. Because like yourself, like this, watching it yourself is great. But when you can talk to somebody who's watched it as well and just geek out over it and just share that, like, that epic feeling that you get with films or whatever that moment is, it's incredible. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it's... Uh it's not too dissimilar than like listening to great music on a, yes. on a nice pair of headphones is awesome. And yeah, I, I love doing it. I do it all the time, but also I like going to a concert when I can. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I haven't been in a while, but it, it's a different experience. You're with other people. Uh, it's a different sound. Yes. It's a different visual. Um, so I'd equate it to that. I think there's space for both of them. Um, but yeah. Uh, I wouldn't recommend watching Avatar on an iPhone, but <laughs> people are going to do it. Um, what was the first film you ever watched? Oh, man. And was it in theaters or was it on like TV or VHS or whatever? That is a good one. I mean, back then, there weren't many movies on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, it was mostly just, you know, episodic television. I mean, to be honest, some of my earliest memories were probably, um, it was probably Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think E.T. was right around there. Um, Raiders of the Lost Dark, early 80s when I was, you know, eight or seven years old. Um, Yeah, like seeing Raiders of the Lost Dark was probably the first movie I saw a couple times in the theaters. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I even remember a friend of mine, um, his mom dropped us off at like a university cause they were screening Raiders Lost Ark at the university in like a lecture hall. I was like seven years old or something. Yeah. Dropped us off and we saw Raiders Lost Ark at this university. Um, but it was probably Empire Strikes Back, maybe, um, Raiders of Lost Ark, early eighties. You know, when all the good movies were made. <laughs> what was that like? Do you remember? Like, do you have any clear memories of it? Or was it just, you just remember it being that just a- epic moment? Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing Empire Strikes Back and um, and just being blown away by the amount of stuff they just shoved in every sequence and image. And I remember coming out of the theater going... I think there was like a snow battle with these like huge (laughs) 
like animal mechanical animals i remember there was like you know swamp with this little frog creature like there was so much you know back then there was just nothing like that there's nothing had ever been created maybe 2001 space odyssey but yeah. nothing at that level had been like developed at such a high-end photographic um but also like super creative level um and i just i probably went home and just started drawing stuff mm -hmm. just drawing as much shit as i could just trying to remember it just yeah, trying to yeah. remember because you couldn't go online and just like look it all up um nah. you had to just uh you had to kind of take it all from memory and try to put it down on paper um yeah it was crazy experience just like i mean i feel like sometimes like the first avatar even the second avatar you go in and you you just are so pulled into that world um doesn't happen that often but certainly mm -hmm. there were movies back then where they were just hitting at such a high rate you know, like movies just coming out all the time. You're just like, my God, they are just like, who are these people that create yeah. these movies? And yeah, again, they still make great movies today, but there was this like period in the eighties where they were just like, you know, visual effects was starting to come into their own yeah. and they're starting to really push visual effects and see where they can take it. Uh, and that kind of informed a lot of the visuals. It was just, it was like a super exciting time um, just to be an audience member and be a kid. Mm. Did you have any uh, understanding of what happens when you watch a film in the theater? Like the level of sound and the screen size? Or were you just like, okay, let's just see no, what's happening and that was it? I had no idea how they made stuff. You couldn't, yeah, they they just didn't have any kind of record of how these things were made i mean obviously they they did because you can see you know you can go back and see all the kind of behind the scenes stuff but i didn't know how to really access any of that mm -hmm. stuff it really wasn't until again art center i had a, a roommate who he had a laser disc player i don't know if you even know what a laser disc player is but i i know of it because i've heard of it but i've never seen one yeah, I mean they're they're yeah. like compact they're like compact discs, but they're yeah. huge. Um and uh and he had one and and at the time I don't think laser discs lasted that long, but at the time they were mm -hmm. kind of made for real cinephiles, real people that were just really into films and uh criterion collections and kind of behind the scenes stuff. So he had like Star Wars trilogy or he had like aliens and it always had like extra material on it. It had like mm -hmm. behind the scenes. This is how we made the movie. Um, and that kind of exposure was like, was great. Cause um, you got to watch how these filmmakers uh, did it. Um, there just wasn't much material out there at the time that, that kind of showed you behind the curtain a bit. Yeah. And these laser disc players um, always had, uh, or uh, the discs themselves always had like a little bonus material on them, um, which was just so cool. Yeah, I, Alien and Aliens, Star Wars, um, a few others, but we would just watch those constantly and kind of break down like, yeah. whoa, that was like a miniature. Blade Runner was probably one of them. Or, you know, if that wasn't a miniature, that's a matte painting. Well, what is a matte painting? Um, you know, how did they get the camera to get in those positions? And and then from a design standpoint, because it sometimes it would show like artwork of how those things were, were developed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I bought a laser displayer years ago because um, they have a like a Criterion collection of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. It was like three discs per movie, double sided. So it was like six sides uh these big discs but they had all this like extra material on it of course you can just go on youtube now and find all of it mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the time that was the only resource to um to find that stuff mm -hmm. my um <clears throat> similar star wars experience w was the same like behind the scenes um i'm more the vhs era 
to the point of like, we used to use them so much or watch them so much. They used to break. I mean, you had to like open it apart and repair it and get oh, it going yeah. again. Um, and it was, I think the 25th anniversary of Star Wars where they had like the gold Darth Vader, black and gold Darth Vader box, the set. Right. Oh and yeah, at yeah, the be- yeah, yeah. At the beginning you had like George Lucas talking about, this is what we did, but that was when I think they remastered it a little bit. Um, so they added like, um, I think that was in episode one where they had the CGI Jabba the Hutt versus the actor that played him first. So it was cool to see some of that. I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. And I remember similar experience of like, I think that was my first profound experience of behind the scenes where it was like meaningful. Otherwise it was just like any of the promo stuff that you saw when they showed, like um, when they're marketing a film, like, oh yeah, this is the month set or this is what it looked like and all of that good stuff. But right. For yourself, like obviously the, the the finished product is incredible, and that's what everybody sees. Do you tend to get more value over of the um, behind the scenes stuff or making of it, at least when you were um, coming up as a designer? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was a huge resource to start to understand because I didn't know, I didn't go to mm-hmm. film school, so it was just a great resource to really um, start to wrap my head around it. I mean, another big influence at the time was Sid Mead. Um, and he had books, you know, um, several books out at the time. Mm-hmm. I couldn't afford them at the time, but, um, I think our library at, uh, at art center had, them. we would like photocopy them. And, uh, <laughs> he, was, he was a huge influence. Like that guy just had such a understanding of form and scale mm-hmm. and color and, and, um, proportion uh and just obviously design in general like um just amazing and he see he went to art center so it was just like a it was like a huge thing to to kind of be influenced by that guy alone there weren't mm-hmm. just there just weren't many artists back then that you really knew of it was sid mead and like ron cobb mm-hmm. um a few others but it, Obviously, there's there's such a, a massive uh, need for artwork and design and concept art these days. There's there's a lot more of us, but uh, but at the time it was just a handful of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I saw his stuff in a magazine or anything, or if I got lucky and got one of his books, yeah, you would just kind of pour over every image and just try to understand how he how he did it. Um, did you ever get to meet Sid? I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, he lived down the street from me for a while oh, in, wow. in South Pasadena. Um, and I got to go over to his house for a few hours Sick. and sit and chat with him. He actually had a, it was around Christmas time and he had an apron on and he was trying to make like a gingerbread house. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys make them over here, but, um, they're like these little cottages yeah. made out of like gingerbread and all this stuff. But he was quite upset at himself because I guess it sat in the sun or something and it completely oh, melted. Um, so it was just funny to see him in that context because you, you spend so much time like revering mm-hmm. these people, but you realize they're, you know, they're just normal human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, but really cool experience getting to, getting to meet him. Um, yeah. And hang out. I, I think I had dinner with him, uh, at a conference, um, of course, going way back, but, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, he would just have people over people, people would like go up to his door and just knock on his door and say, Uh, Hey, I'm trying to get into the industry or, Hey, I'm like a big fan. He would just have them come in and sit down and chat with them. And yeah, it was crazy. What was like, what was his, um, attitude towards, I guess talking about design and creativity, obviously his work speaks for itself. It's still iconic to this day and probably will be forever. But what was his like thoughts towards design in general? Did he always have that kind of like a core philosophy that he'd always kind of like tell people oh, this is what you should aim towards or be, or did he have a different like kind of vibe altogether? Yeah. I, I don't remember specific conversations other uh-huh. than, just general topics like he was just really interested in engineering mm. and where engineering was headed, different processes of making 
you know, a building or a vehicle or a city, uh, like urban planning. Like he was really, his head was really in like, well, where are we going to be 30, 40, a hundred years from now? And how mm -hmm. are those things going to be manufactured and created not only on earth, but in space? He was really, I mean, yeah, those are some of the subjects I remember uh, him talking about. Cause he, he worked for companies like us steel where he would be asked by like real corporations to be like, okay, where's, what does manufacturing look like in the future? Mm -hmm. What does the automotive industry wow. look like in the future? So I think that's kind of where his head was at, even though he's of course known for some really big films that he worked on. Yeah. I think his kind of like bread and butter was trying to, was, was working with corporations and them hiring him to kind of, project into the future and future technologies and, and, and manufacturing in general. Cool. Well, I believe, I don't know if it's a term he coined himself or is put onto him, but like he's considered a futurist. And obviously that makes sense. Like that's hmm. even cooler, at least from my perspective, of course he can make these stunning designs, amazing forms, but to be asked to basically design the future, so to speak, like that's probably one of the coolest briefs you can get. Uh, versus, you know, like design a spaceship. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it, but, you know, in some sense, it's a little, there's a lot of, for me, there would be a lot of anxiety of like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I've got to kind of get this right. So I've got to do my homework and kind of understand yeah. it. I can't bullshit my way through it. Um, it's got to, it's got to feel like it can actually, work or that it's some part of some evolutionary stem of where we are today and projecting in the future and some kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, it requires a real understanding of those processes today. And I think he just had that, or he was just like mm -hmm. really into it. Um, and you can see it in his design and you can see it in his artwork. Um, I think it'd freak me out a little bit. I mean, we, mm -hmm. Hollywood is, is, you know, it's a fantasy version of, um, our cultures today are our cultures tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, we're not trying to anticipate. We're not trying to, um, be these kind of like fortune tellers and tell audiences, this is what it's going to look like in the future. We're trying to tell a story and those visuals need to support the story. And it doesn't necessarily mean this is what the world's going to look like 50, mm -hmm. 100 years in the future. This is just what our, idea of it could be but where sid mead was coming from is he was really trying to understand and be a predictor of of some of that those future technologies do you have a favorite sid mead project or piece or oh, design even? i got to see um i think he was still alive at the time they did a gallery um of his um artwork um so i got to see it like in reality and like they do beautiful books um, of his work, but mm -hmm. they're even more vibrant and, and like lifelike in reality, like seeing them up close. I mean, there were so many, Oh man, I loved all his like vehicles from like the seventies, like in parking lots or, or uh, mm -hmm. driveways of futuristic houses with weird creatures. Um, there was one painting that they had in that gallery he he did this painting of the moon, but it was like a like a photo of the moon during the day, so it was all blue mm -hmm. sky. But the moon was terraformed, so you saw this like the like along the equator, this big like terraformed line through mm -hmm. the moon, and it was just like the the coolest painting. That the values were just right, and the detail was just really believable. Um, but yeah, there, there's. Man, there, there's so many of them. All this Blade Runner stuff was, of course, um, very seminal for the time of like cool um, cyberpunk, mm -hmm. uh, futuristic retro future um, that just kind of obviously influenced everybody beyond that. Um, yeah, there just there's so many. I, mm. I don't know how that guy. Like, I feel like if I took all my artwork and laid it out on, in like a huge industrial space and I 
took all the stuff that I liked versus all the stuff that I didn't like. Like the stuff I liked would just be in this tiny little corner of the room. <laughs> Everything <laughs> I didn't like or thought was just terrible would be 90%, 95% of that room. Yeah. Um, whereas I feel like Sid Mead was just firing on all cylinders all the time. Like he just couldn't do any wrong. Um, yeah. Um, I like what you said there about like liking a certain percentage of your work. Like, but for yourself, like obviously when you're working is mainly for a tax, mainly for a job, as opposed to, I guess, um, doing something for yourself. But when you make something, like what's, do you tend to dwell on it after it's finished or once it's done, you've forgotten about it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I've talked to other artists and designers and I feel like sometimes I get halfway through something and I'm like, ooh, this is looking really good. I'm really mm -hmm. liking where this is going. Yeah, I'm feeling good about myself. And then I'll finish it and be like, oh, man, I totally screwed it up. I should have just stopped while I was ahead. Or I'll finish it and be like, yeah, that's pretty good. And I'll come back to it the following morning and be like, what was I thinking? This is terrible. Yeah. I think that's, I, I don't know, maybe that's an inherent thing to artists, but uh, I don't really like revisiting my art too mm -hmm. much. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, you know, there's some stuff I feel pretty proud about and good about, but most of it, cause you are, you're trying to do it. Um, you're not doing it in a vacuum for the film mm -hmm. industry. You're, you're doing it for a director or, you know, the production or the, the, the uh, studio to kind of get those ideas across that are, you know, initially start on a script. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really your, it's not your design. It's not mm -hmm. even sometimes your aesthetic. You're trying to, you're trying to do it to support the, um, the, the, that project, that show, that film. Mm -hmm. um, and all you can hope for is that you do something that, you know, is, is kind of aligned with, with the director's vision or with the studio's mm -hmm. vision. Um, yeah. Which is a different way to think than if you're just doing art on your own and for your own satisfaction, it's great. Mm -hmm. But doing film work is, is entirely different. You're doing it as part of a, a collective. Mm. Do you have a preference over doing work, I guess, for a project, for a client, for a director versus doing your own projects? Oh, man, I just haven't had time to really do my own projects. I used to try to write and, you know, um, do a little bit of uh, my own IP stuff, but mm -hmm. it's it's time consuming. It takes mm -hmm. when you have like a kids and you have a job that needs to like feed these kids and pay the mortgage and all that stuff it's like hard to like the last thing sometimes i want to do at the end of the night is like do more of it mm -hmm. um, and now that i'm in this production design position it's even longer hours and more demanding so um yeah i mean one day i'd love to get back into it and kind of do some of my own stuff Mm -hmm. um, but I also really enjoy my job as stressful mm -hmm. as it may be. I enjoy working with other people and problem solving and figuring things out. Um, mm -hmm. It's exciting. Um, sometimes I'm not totally satisfied just being in my own head. I mm -hmm. like kind of figuring out with other people. Yes. There's definitely, I'm not sure if you agree, but there's definitely like a certain, I guess the thing about collaboration or being put on a collaborative task or being asked to do something that's not of your own, it does definitely tap into a different side of your creative mind and maybe yield results that you could definitely not do yourself. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's roads you go down when you're working with other people in collaboration where uh, you just never thought you'd go down. Uh, mm -hmm or a director really pushes you to um, go in a different direction um, and not just kind of like do the usual stuff. Like if mm -hmm. they're, 
if they're one of these super creative directors, um, they'll keep pushing you to, to find it and find it. And cause the, they're, mm-hmm. they want to, they want to be unique and they want to be fresh and new and um, have their own kind of point of view. So it's cool to kind of have to try to figure that out. Uh, It's not just about you saying, okay, well, this is, this is what it should be. It's a blue square. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, I want a yellow triangle. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to give you a blue square. No, it's got to be more than just a blue square. It's got to have, another shape to it, another color yeah. to it. try something else. And you have to kind of, you have to get, you have to get to that yellow triangle sometimes. I don't know. Bad analogy, but <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying. No, totally. Um, what kind of skills though, because for, especially people who maybe experienced that for the first time, it can throw some people off or they can see that as maybe as a negative, like or a bit of pushback or their ideas rejected. What kind of, I guess, skills or, attitude one should have to navigate that situation in order to get the best results as a creative and obviously for your brief as well. Yeah. I mean, what I tell people, you know, they're asking about, you know, being successful and in, in the mm-hmm. entertainment industry in general is like, I really try to tell them first and foremost, you kind of have to be a, a jack of all trades. You kind of have to know a little bit about everything and hopefully you know one of those things like really well, but you can also do other things. Um, you have to have a big toolkit. It can't just be one little, Hey, I've got these three tools. I'm really good at it. You know, you might get hired just based on that one thing and maybe you'll Mm -hmm. work on a project for a month or something. But if you can show that your toolkit is much bigger, Hey, I can do this. I can do that. I can do a little bit of that it's really valuable to somebody like a director or a production Mm -hmm. designer. And at at the same time, you'll, you'll probably work longer on that project because you'll just get more and more stuff thrown at you. Um, Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a Jack of all trades, understanding, you know, lighting composition, understanding 3d, 2d, um, having a pretty good understanding of architecture, you don't have to be an architect, um, but you have to understand a little bit behind how things are built or why they're built a certain way or why they're proportioned a certain, excuse me, a certain way. Um, you know, you don't have to be able to build your own house, but if you're asked mm-hmm. to do like an interior of a, a kitchen or something, you kind of have to be able to, you know, block it out and understand certain ceiling heights and door heights and cabinet and um, counter heights. Um, And you have to be kind of into that Um, because you're in the film industry, you're, you're, you know, there's a lot of sci-fi, but there's a lot of like trying to make things look like they're real, trying to make it Mm -hmm. look like they're part of our world and not some super fantasy thing where everything is Mm -hmm. just has its own rules. Uh, so yeah, I think the first and foremost is like, just not only have those skills, but show those skills in your portfolio, like, you know, um, have the sci-fi stuff, but if you can show that you can do like, a, you know, historical, you know, London in the 1700s or something, and you have an understanding of the architecture of the time, um, that's just a plus. That's just like an added thing that you can use. And, um, people are going to look for that, um, Mm -hmm. that skill to be able to understand it on all those levels. Mm. Regarding portfolios themselves. Um, you definitely answered a big chunk of it, which is what to include in your portfolio, at least the type of content and topics and basically show your designer. Right. Um, but what other kind of rules, or traits that you would like to see or should, or you think should be in portfolios? Um, I mean, on top of all of that, that I've suggested, I mean, in the film industry, like a really good understanding of lighting is really important. Um, even though you don't work with the director of photography, um, 
you're working for the art department, uh, having a good understanding of why light affects a certain space, an interior or an exterior, um, why things are illuminated a certain way or how they're illuminated, uh, I think is super important. Like an understanding of material. I see a lot of artists, they do great shapes and forms and stuff, but they're all kind of one material, you know, they're all kind of like default matte finish metal or something, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. a real understanding. And look at Sid Mead, cause he would put like a Chrome strip next to like, you know, a highly polished, uh, painted strip to, you know, matte finish. Yeah. Like an understanding of materials is really important. Um, and then, you know, on top of all that other stuff that I mentioned, like, architecture like i love going out and just looking at architecture and taking photography of architecture um i think you could tell a good artist by if you say hey go spend a couple hours researching um art deco architecture and you kind of start to get an understanding pretty quickly of their eye like just their taste Mm -hmm. based on what they find if they just go on google and just type in art deco and just dump like a bunch of obvious art deco stuff into a folder you you know kind of where they're at but if they dig deeper and find oh there was this architect that had never been really known about and look at these buildings that were even never built um you know just throwing stuff out there but It's like if they dig a little deeper into it and find something else, um, you're going to want to gravitate to those people. Like a good yeah. researcher is hard to find. Um, and m- a lot of our job is just good research, is a good mm-hmm. understanding of the world around us. Um, not just like watching Star Wars or, you know, or Blade Runner or something, mm-hmm. but like having a real understanding of, you know, how things are built or how things look in the, the real world. Cool. I love the topic of research. Um, and how do you stop? I mean, first of all, like what, how often do you do research? Like, do you do it constantly? Is it like an ongoing thing or is it I only project-based? I was just doing research right before our call. <laughs> nice, nice. I mean, I have, a, I have a lot of books at home. I have a little yeah. home office and it's just covered in books. And I, uh-huh. um, I love looking through the books because there's so much in those books that you just can't find online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's also a ton of stuff that you can find online. Yeah. So I was, I was just, I was just online right before the call, just digging through a bunch of stuff and pulling it into a folder. And then I'll have, you know, um, my people in my art department, they'll print all that out, put it on a big board and Mm -hmm. start to kind of give us a, a bit of a, assembly of what that scene or that set could look like. Um, It's hugely important. I think the worst thing you can do is if you got an assignment from a production designer or whomever, art director, and they're like, do this thing. And the the worst thing you can do is just like pick up your Wacom pen or your mouse and just start doing something from nothing, just from your own brain. I mean, it's important Mm -hmm. to have a bunch of stuff up there, Mm -hmm. but the the best the best artists out there will they'll spend some time looking at research they'll put together like a little collection of research themselves and you can look at that research and be like oh you totally get like what i'm going for mm. just based on that image imagery you've collected um yeah it's for me it's hugely important it's one of the most important pieces mm. of all of it to be honest Do you ever get lost in research or find yourself falling into research rabbit holes? Oh man, all the time. (laughs) Had I not taken this call with you and been on this podcast of yours, I'd probably still be doing it. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, totally. And then the internet does that to you too. I think that's Mm -hmm. the other nice thing about books is, you know, there's obviously like a stopping point. Um, But there's also, what's great about books is, there's no algorithm behind it. Like you can pick Mm -hmm. up a book and it could be on like the Saharan desert or something. You'd be like, Ooh, that's kind of an interesting structure. 
like I'll pull that into it. But yeah. if you're looking for the same thing online, it it starts to create an algorithm for you mm-hmm. um, and put you in these kind of like certain channels. And I think looking through books, there's just like unexpected stuff all the time because you might not yes. be looking for that exact same thing. But yeah, totally found, sounding like an old man saying oh, that. <clears throat> But it's, yeah, I think it's still an important resource for sure. I, I totally agree with you. And I think books, and it's quite obvious when you think about it, but it's probably where a lot of, you'll find some serious gold in books, especially, like you said, obscure ones. Um, I've been hunting more recently at our local library or anywhere. There's even this cafe in a local beauty spot where they're just selling like just random books. And yeah. I nearly got close to buying this uh, recipe book just because the diagrams in that didn't buy in the end. Um, I don't know why, but it didn't have enough cool stuff in there for me. But I just remember like almost falling into that rabbit hole of this recipe book, just thinking that this is cool. Yeah. Or just the way certain, the way the pages were laid out or whatever it is, there's always something that you can get inspired by. Um, but regarding like ref- research themselves, like do you have a hard rule of like how many images or pieces of information you need? Or does it purely depend on the project and you know what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the project, but um, I just try to, I have like, I have like a general folder on my hard drive and it's broken down into different subject matters. And if I find new stuff, I try to, I try to organize it into that system. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll try to go through that and it's thousands of images and I'll, and I'll usually just go through the entire catalog in the beginning of a project, just mm-hmm. be like, Ooh, I'll pull that out. I, w- I wasn't going to go into that folder, but I'll pull, pull that image out and kind of create a new system for that specific project. Yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I forget what question you were asking specifically, but uh, if there's like an uh, image limit or like, um, a cutoff point that you have, like, okay, I know it's getting a bit wild now. Let's just stop here. Um, <laughs> or do you just let it just flow until you kind of know you got enough of what you need? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a constant growing, evolving yeah. thing. And by the end of a project, I'll have thousands of pieces of just yeah. single images for that one project. And then sometimes I'll, like the other day, I was going through an earlier project like the creator and I was going through all that reference and starting to pull mm-hmm. some of it into this one. Uh, Cause some of there's some gems that you might not use in a previous one that might mm-hmm. be like cooler and more relevant for this one. So I try to keep all of those reference folders, even though they're just huge yes. reference folders from each project, I'll try to dig back into those sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's totally overwhelming and sometimes it just gets to be too much, mm-hmm. but um, and you, you know, everybody gravitates towards their own like looks and stuff. Mm. So I will kind of pull stuff out and, and use it from show to show. And then if you're lucky, you work with a director like Gareth Edwards, who has like a real design sense and kind of a sensibility similar to, to your taste, which is, makes it a lot easier. Mm. Uh, and he loves reference too. He, he, he'll send me hundreds and hundreds of images here here's here's hundreds of images of logo design nice. you know um and you'll just be like oh my god there's so much here but like what do i do with this and i'll try mm. to like edit it down but he has this like huge appetite for for reference um and it's great it's great to kind of yeah be able to get all of that stuff and start going through it start to get an understanding of where his his head is at because mm. yeah you have a lot of conversations with directors but if you have like a a huge library of visual content mm. from them it's it's invaluable it's 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 so important to have uh, so that's almost like his notes but purely in image image form yeah yeah mm. yeah and not everybody works that way but that's yeah. part of um he won't say he's a he's a great artist but he does his his sketches are super informative like you Mm. start to really understand like where his head is at compositionally or like a design or shape or something 
uh, and that that's really helpful. But yeah, he's he loves a good a good folder of a thousand images of reference. <laughs> um, it's really helpful. It's it's super helpful. And with other directors you've worked with, have I'm, I'm assuming some have been complete opposite, right? It's pure either just just text or words or I guess without any images. And what's that like when you have when you get that thrown at you? Yeah, I mean that could be that can be difficult sometimes, but also in a way a little bit liberating because they mm -hmm. they kind of look for you to kind of help them mm -hmm. um you know, build that look and feel. And some of them can't draw at all or don't use a lot of reference, but they're also but their their vocabulary, the way they describe things verbally is like really mm -hmm. helpful. And they may do like a little quick little sketch of something and it, it just looks like chicken scratch or kind of mm -hmm. just like, but you understand like where they want the camera or where they want an actor to stand versus like a piece of architecture. It, it's really helpful. Like the simplest of little sketches can go mm -hmm. a long way, mm -hmm. but, um, but typically they're all very, um, you know, they, they have a talent for like verbalizing kind of what they mm -hmm. want. And do you have to sometimes, and I guess not just necessarily the directors, just generally in the production process from whatever role you're working, like do you have to kind of extract information either through lines of questioning or other means, maybe top secret, um, to get what you need to fulfill your task? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Um there's no one way on a project there's just you know either you're on zooms all mm -hmm. the time or you're in a you're in a production meeting for hours or you're doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with the director for a few hours and you're just kind of you've got a big stack of paper and they're kind of sketching and you're sketching and mm -hmm. um sometimes you know you'll be sketching while they're on a zoom call and they're like, yeah, okay. Um, try to make that blue, flip that around, uh, cut mm -hmm. that left side out, take the right side of this thing and stitch it together. And it's a little crazy and a little, um, little insane and kind of a lot of anxiety behind it, but it's also kind of exhilarating to kind of just, again, be in this kind of collaborative. It's like you're, mm -hmm you're like building this collage of all these things and you don't even know where the collage is going. And you just keep on mm -hmm. adding images and images. And eventually the hope is that, you know, it makes something mm -hmm. um, and you find something in it. Um, but yeah, it could be a little crazy. And it, so I, I think my point is it's like, it, it's everything. It's not just, mm -hmm. I think that, the thought is people are like, well, you just provide them like the coolest looking, slickest, amazing image. And they're like, okay, I can't, I can't do better than that. I'm going to just <laughs> make an image out of that. It's not that way. It, I tend to look at work when I can very loose and, and iterative and, and kind of just, it can be quite messy of a process. It's not mm -hmm. about like how neat you can get that line or how, how, well that surface can roll over the other surface it's it's getting mm. kind of the big picture more than anything um speaking of pictures that uh, one question i forgot to ask you regarding references you said you get them printed off and put on a board is that a personal preference thing that do you prefer exploring or starting a project that way versus i have I'm, I'm assuming you have stuff on the screen obviously as well to refer back to but what is the power of like having stuff physically in front of you yeah, I mean, we usually have both. We have a document that mirrors what right. is printed out. But you know, if you're if you're in an art department and you have access to producers and directors, sometimes we have what is called a war room, and mm -hmm. we'll just like plaster the whole room with printed out imagery, and we'll get like a nice big oversized printer. Um, but it's it just helps everybody kind of be on the same page so to speak, like mm -hmm. people can go in and go, Oh my God, this is like how the movie is starting to come together. And you could put it chronologically too. You can, here's like the beginning of the movie. Here's mm -hmm. the middle of the movie. Here's the end, first, second, third act. Um, 
it just helps people be in the same room rather than mm-hmm. flipping through a keynote or a PDF. It it's again, it's it's still one of those like super collaborative um, industries, um, and and sometimes it can still be super old school that we still mm-hmm. print stuff out. I like going into a room and being able to quickly take something off and put something else, pin it back Mm -hmm. over Mm -hmm. it or um, yeah. And then oftentimes we will have to like, you know, bring the studio or producers into that room and pitch those ideas. Mm. Um, And it's just, it's nice to all be in a, in the same room. You might have, um, you know, we might do little models of sets or vehicles or something. You Uh lay those out on the table. Um, yeah, it just helps everybody kind of, again, get on the same page. You just mentioned their pitching. Do you like pitching or is it just part of, I guess, you know, like what you have to do to work in the industry? Yeah, I like it. I mean, I, it was a skill that I learned in school, like in design Mm -hmm. school, you had to stand up in front of the class and your teacher and you had to pitch your ideas and, uh, it, it's a little nerve wracking and it was certainly scary back then, but it, it was a skill that they, um, that they really drilled into you. Um, I think it's really important to be able to talk about your ideas in front of a group of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not a typical skill that an artist usually has. Uh, it's, it's something that you have to really develop. So yeah, I like, I like pitch, pitching, but, um, you kind of you have to be comfortable talking about your ideas not just in mm-hmm. an email but um you know in front of a room of people mm-hmm. um regarding your career very impressive one um what was um the first film or the first movie or the first show you worked on um it was this terry gilliam movie called fear and loathing in las vegas with johnny ah, okay. depp uh, I didn't work on it for that long. Um, but, um, I got to do all these crazy, like, um, one, uh, casino, Las Vegas casino was, uh, kind of circus theme. So I had to do these kind of different circus booths, like game booths, um, that people can play, you know, throwing darts or stuff. And it is supposed to be kind of weird and twisted. I, never kind of done anything that like that before, but it was Mm -hmm. like really fun to kind of immerse myself into. Um, But yeah, I think that was, I think that was the first one. Mm. Uh, I worked on galaxy quest briefly. Ah. That was one of the first projects, but uh, they needed a very specific design that they needed help on. And I kind of came in and um, designed this, this, Omega 13 object. Um, yeah, that was pretty early on late, late nineties. Oh my God. <laughs> and in, in fear and loathing, um, you mentioned, obviously that was like something you never done before in terms of, was it more like the design task you had never done before that subject matter? Yeah. I never worked on like a casino interior, uh, this kind of carnival gone wrong tripping out on acid kind of look <laughs> of things and the production designer alex mcdowell just asked me to come up with these different games uh and just make them as weird and bizarre and strange as you can so i just did these facade booths um i don't know how many i did but um but it was great it was crazy mm-hmm. it was a crazy challenge um but he just had me go for it and um it was a lot of fun. Um, obviously, I would have been more comfortable working on some sci-fi movie with yeah, yeah. aliens invasions and stuff. But um, I think uh, I think it really challenged me, and it kind of goes back to that earlier point where you're asking um, about just different skills to have, and yeah, <laughs> you really have to be a bit of a jack of all trades. If somebody just asks you, "Hey," we've got this movie and you've got to do these kind of crazy clowns and uh, strange casino carnival thing. Your answer shouldn't be no. It should be, yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to figure it out. And 
were there any more cases throughout your career where you kind of faced with similar challenges, like completely new challenges that you'd never expected or maybe perhaps out of your comfort zone? Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, I think every movie is like a new challenge. Mm. And it could be a movie that I feel like I I can really wrap my head around it if it's a sci-fi movie or something. Uh, but every single one has a different challenge because you're mm -hmm. working with different people oftentimes who have different opinions and different points of view and aesthetics and tastes. So I think every one is like a, a real challenge, but the hope mm -hmm. is like you learn something new from it. Like I worked on Steven Spielberg's Lincoln film and I got to learn about the civil war and kind mm -hmm. of that time in America in the late 1800s, uh, which I probably didn't pay enough attention to in school, mm -hmm. but I got a, like a real, you know, history lesson um, working on that film. Yeah. Um, and some movies are harder than others because they're, they're, they're a real challenge to, to figure out like the force awakens. It was star Wars, which I was so excited about, but mm -hmm. it was like, well, what does star Wars look like now? Cause they did mm. the original trilogy. They did the prequels. Well, what are these next movies going to look like? And it was a really challenge to, you know, try to figure out that aesthetic you're working with excuse me, really talented people, but, um, uh, sorry, re really talented people, but it's a super challenge to kind of figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. cause we just didn't really know what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, every film you go into, it, it's a, all, it's a new challenge. I think the first mm -hmm. few weeks are kind of the str most stressful, uh weeks of the whole the whole project because you're just trying to wrap your head around what what does this all mean mm -hmm. and between like two i guess you got two types of projects the ones that are established ips and ones that are completely blue sky and how everything kind of has to be figured out do you have a preference for each one or you don't mind whichever you get given um I definitely don't want to do the same thing twice. Um, right. I like, I like a new challenge. Um, I mean, blue sky is a, it's, it's a term that's thrown around pretty loosely. I don't think I've ever worked on a project where it's just been blue sky, you know, mm -hmm. these projects, they're funded by studios that they don't want to spend money just having people sit around, just thinking about, Ooh, what if, what yeah, if yeah. this, guy was was green what would that look like or what if everybody had you know two arms coming out of the top of their heads like they <laughs> they want you to kind of get down to it they want you to break down the script and kind of get a real understanding of where the director wants to go um there's very little time for like blue sky thinking um mm -hmm. i do like it when when there is the 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 small little moments where you do have that time, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it doesn't happen that often. Um, you just have to read the script, break down the script and then work with people that are like, okay, we need to kind of solve this problem. We need to solve this problem. And um, you just kind of get right into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And regarding, um, I'd love to ask you about the creator, but before we get to that, which are the standout films and shows that you've worked on that had an impact on you, either as a creative or just generally like a sense of pride, maybe working on those or just, and maybe another experience that was like, okay, that's made me connect with that particular project or that movie. Yeah. I mean, um, I've been lucky enough to, to be in a lot of projects that I, you know, I, I was pretty proud of being a part of like minority report was probably a, you know, I was in my mid twenties at the time mm -hmm. and working on the Fox lot on a science fiction project for Steven Spielberg. Like that was just insanity. Um, so to be a part of that, um, was really cool. And, you know, it, it probably was one of those films where, um, 
it had a real feeling of trying to predict a little bit of the future and see where things were going, which not a lot of films try to do. So oh, excuse me. it was unique in that way where we got to kind of take what we were learning from school and kind of applying it to a film of mm -hmm. futuristic transportation systems and technologies. Um, so that was really cool. But there's also like the added pressure of like, oh shit, I'm working on a Steven Spielberg science fiction yeah. movie. Let's not mess this up. Um, so with that kind of level, there's also an added level of um, pressure um, to get it right. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas like a smaller film, um, there's just, there's just less pressure. Um, but, you know, working on that, working on Avatar with Jim Cameron, obviously I grew up with Jim Cameron and yeah. revered his work and still, and I still do to this day. Um, and he, he was like, you know, he was a concept artist. He mm -hmm. was a concept artist turned art director, or like visual effects art director and worked for Roger Corman on these like really small, crazy science fiction movies. Um, and kind of made his way up there. So it was, um, it was cool to work on that. But again, there was like the added pressure of like, Oh shit, I'm working on a Jim Cameron mm -hmm. sci-fi movie. Uh, let's not, let's not screw this up. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know what my point was. There's, there's several, there's several projects that I, I'm pretty proud to be a, a part of and then being part of the star Wars universe was yeah. also like a whole thing that I never thought would happen. Mm -hmm. Um, because I wasn't driving towards that. I just happened to right. kind of be in the right place at the right time. Um, so that, that was like a great experience and being able to like be at I ILM and watch the original trilogy and their big, um, theater and just be like, oh my God, I'm Sick. like watching Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi at ILM in this like big massive theater with THX sound yeah. systems <laughs> and um and just like the history there and um was like was just crazy cool. Um yeah, and all the experience of being able to see like the Millennium Falcon being built at Pinewood in London be able to work in London mm -hmm. um, on those projects was, was just like, yeah, very, very cool. What's it like being on set versus I guess not being on set. Like, does it help you creatively or is it just nice to see the, I guess the, the finished results, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really like the payoff for all of it, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I like working on video games and I like seeing how um, all that, progresses and gets into like a, an actual like virtual environment, but to be able to stand, um, you know, on a stage and see some of the stuff you worked on with other teams of people or your influence on some of those sets and actually see them being built is really cool. It's like the closest to being like a real architect and seeing mm -hmm. your building, you know, being built on a real site. So, um, and then they bring cameras in and they light it and then they shoot it. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like super intoxicating to, wow. to kind of be on that set and to be a part of it and know that you were, you had some influence on that. Production designer. How long have you been one now? Not long, three years now, uh, three and a half years. Um, I production designed a, a animated feature that never went anywhere back in right. like, uh, I don't know, 2010 or something. Um, and I've done art direction here and there, but yeah, uh, it's, it's only recent. Um, and it's a whole different type of job. It's, um, mm -hmm. you still try to be creative, but, there's so many levels that you have to be creative on. I mean, mm. locations are a big part of it. So you'll spend time going out to locations and looking with location manager of like, okay, we need a jungle or we need a beach or we need a Canyon. 
Um, and then you kind of present some of those ideas back to the director and say, Hey, this is what I thought the best Canyon would be. Or, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to bring in the DP and, um, all these, all these film people to kind of come in your team and convince them this is the best Canyon for this scene. <laughs> um, and then you do that with sets, you do that with props, you do that with, um, vehicles. Um, it's just so multi-layered happening mm -hmm. all at once, you know, as a concept artist, I can kind of focus on one thing and kind of be mm -hmm. focused, but here you have to like be focused on 200 things all at once. Um, what made you yeah. navigate to that role? Um, I always kind of wanted to do it, but kind of held off on doing it it does require a lot of travel and kind of being away from home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was hesitant to do that. Um, but uh, on the creator, I just got a chance because uh, I knew one of the producers and she was like, just go down and meet Gareth Edwards. He's putting a new movie together. See if you guys click. And we, you know, we went to like this pub in, um, in Santa Monica in California and, uh, we wound up like talking for like three or four hours, just about like movies we loved or television mm -hmm. we loved. Sick. Um, and I, I don't even know if we talked about his movie that much. <laughs> we just nerded out for like four hours. Um, and I think, you know, I think at that point he was like, okay, I, I kind of trust this guy enough to pull this off. Mm. Um, and he had another process of how he wanted to do it. He wanted to, the way he wanted to make his movie would require more uh, design kind of in post-production and not as much in pre-production or during mm -hmm. the shoot. He knew he would have like a big post-production design part of it. And I was, you know, a VFX art director at ILM and it just mm -hmm. seemed like a, a kind of a good fit. Cool. What was that project like for you? Like but obviously, speaking as a concept artist, it's concept art heaven, that film, especially all the designs in there and how it looks and how it all came about. But as someone who was heavily involved in the project, what was it like? Yeah, I mean, it was it was exciting. It was you don't get to work a lot. There's oftentimes you're not working on a truly original IP. Mm -hmm. And this was something that Gareth wrote years ago and has been thinking about and the studio trusted him to, to kind of do this thing. That's not based on a franchise or a book or something that's already been done before. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. And the fact that we, we both really, um, we love this movie Baraka. Uh, it's a, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but yes. Yep it's just one of the most like visually stunning films ever created. Yes. And we love that influence of going to like real places and seeing new cultures and new people and how they live and um, work and applying that kind of conceit to this movie of like going somewhere else and feeling like you're in a new place, but then like push it into 50 60 years into the future mm -hmm. and see what, mm -hmm. see what that gives you. Um, so yeah, it was very cool. And it was, it was great to work with him on that level because we just, we just kind of had a similar vision of mm -hmm. where we wanted to take it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was exciting, but it was a little scary too. Cause it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, what, what is this? We're trying to make something that's our own and, has a has a like a bespoke look to it but that's hard it's, it's hard to do that sometimes because mm. there has been just so much visual content over the past 10 20 years yeah. um it's really hard to do something new and fresh you're so influenced by everything around you and you're yeah. you're like inundated with so much great stuff too um so that was a process and that was you know that wasn't easy to start to kind of develop our own look 
and you can obviously see influences, but every, every movie, every video game, every piece of content is influenced by something else. Mm -hmm. But we were really trying our best to kind of create something new and fresh. Mm. Was that, how challenging was that? Cause like, whether you're making a project or trying to, you know, like lock in a particular piece or just refine something, sometimes it just clicks and sometimes you really have to like force it in or you know, just do some crazy things just to make it work. What did you have that? I guess, did you have all of those experiences or was it a constant challenge trying to find that look, trying to find that unique flavor and define the create the, the universe of the creator that it is on its own, standing on its own two feet? Yeah, I mean, it, it it evolved throughout the entire process. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we had to design certain things up front and get those designs ready for construction and um, so they can shoot something. But, but also a lot of what Gareth shot um, on location in Thailand or Cambodia or Nepal um, informed kind of the look and feel of what we would design back into it. It's a mm -hmm. little bit of a reversal of how you do things because usually in a movie you kind of create everything first and go, okay, this is what your movie's going to look like. Let's try to figure mm -hmm. that out. But we tried to have some faith in like, okay, we don't know what this is going to entirely look like. We have an idea and we kind of – we have sketches and artwork to kind of support it, but we – we know that there's going to be a process pretty far down the road of like, all right, now we have to design our robots or we have to design this massive tank going through this village. We wanted Gareth to kind of tell us what, how, what, how, um, how it's all going to feel like mm. uh, and look. And we didn't want to try to design it and then him – have to kind of figure it out after we wanted mm. him to like just shoot his movie and then we would kind of design back into it and be influenced by those worlds mm. rather than the other way around if that makes any sense totally and was there any particular either subject matter or element of the film or even just a, a design that was the most challenging or that you, that you just remember being okay that was a hard one to yeah. get over the line there was a lot, and I think the the nomad, which is that kind of big, um, basically yeah. space station kind of thing. Um, we did a lot of sketches. We had we had a little time to kind of design that because we our show was a little bit put on hold during COVID. So mm -hmm. Gareth and I just spent a lot of time on Zoom, just talking about what it is and doing a lot of artwork and. Uh, we brought this artist, uh, Alex Senegal, to kind of come yep. in and help kind of define some of the, the form language of it all. But like what it was, was a really, it was a real challenge. It was like trying to figure out what the, the Death Star should be. Yeah, um, yeah. And we eventually arrived on this idea <clears throat> where um, it was kind of, it was kind of like a bird of prey that was just mm, hovering. Yeah looking for its next victim. Um, and once we kind of settled on that shape, it allowed us to kind of really understand where we can go with it and figure out all the little details rather mm -hmm. than trying to figure out all the details first. So once we kind of had that general shape, um, it, it kind of moved a lot quicker. Um, but yeah, that was like a, that was a really hard challenge because you want something to, I always try to do stuff that feels memorable. Like if mm -hmm. you went home and could actually sketch it, or if like a, if like an eight year old can go home and like sketch it kind of like when mm -hmm. I saw empire strikes back, I could remember what a lot of that stuff looks like because they designed it to be inherently memorable. Like you can mm -hmm. draw a tie fighter, you can draw an X wing with like five lines or something like that. Um, and I think, I think the designers, I think George Lucas knew that back then, that if you design memorable shapes, not only can you understand it from a cinematic point of view, that you understand, okay, those are the bad guys, those are the good guys, mm -hmm. even though they're flying around um, fast and shooting at each other. Um, if you can create memorable shapes, it just starts to define the look of your movie. 
Um, so at every turn, we tried to create memorable shapes, which is just, it's not easy. And without being biased at all, are you proud and happy with the results that you guys came up with? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm super proud of all the work that went into it. And uh, each company and each uh, department that that had a had a play into it. Yeah, I'm. I think it looks it looks like a really great uh original looking movie um which again they don't they don't come by that often so uh, yeah super proud of it now you guys definitely nailed it um and as a production designer i guess like what were the biggest takeaways for yourself either as a professional or maybe something that you had learned maybe about yourself or just new like just working with the industry in general, like what did you take away from that whole experience of working on the creator? Um, that you just have to be, um, you know, you're in a leadership position and you have to mm. show leadership um, with your entire crew. Um, you have to be kind of like part parent and part boss and part collaborative artist. Like you have to kind of do all of this stuff um because it it doesn't come down to just the artwork it comes down Mm. to just being able to kind of make a decision like on the fly and then do Mm. that ten thousand times a day (laughs) and hopefully you don't screw up and let your team down um but yeah it's just really a matter of leadership and kind of being on top of it um a lot of it is like to be honest, you kind of fake it till you make it. And mm-hmm. I had never done it before. And it was a pretty big film and very demanding visual film. And I just kind of had to fake it till I made it. I mean, I, I've, I've worked in the industry long enough to kind of know how the roles work. and Right. But I had never really done it myself. So, um, but yeah, it was a lot of just making, making it up as you go. <laughs> um, but, and then leaning on leaning on your team and leaning on, um, you know, your director or producers to kind of help you through it. Mm. Um, and you learn so much. You, every day you just learn. Like I, I can get into 3d or 2d and kind of be in my head and I, I kind of know what I'm doing. And on some level I'm, I'm on autopilot, but, uh, in that role, you're just, um, it's just a whole nother thing where you're just having to like operate on such a fast level um, and new challenges and new things are just when you think you have a handle on it, like 30 new challenges kind of come through an email or a call or something. Um, so you just, yeah, you have to think on your feet and you just have to be a, you have to get to have some good leadership. Um, and, you know, obviously having a good eye and uh, <clears throat> having a good, have, having taste and mm-hmm. being kind of <clears throat> aligned with the director is important, but ultimately it's just being a good leader and um, and just being able to handle all the challenges that are thrown at you. Amazing. James, we're unfortunately our allotted time. Um, before we wrap up, any final thoughts or words from yourself to the listeners? No, I mean, I feel like we, I feel like we covered it all. It's just, you know, it's, uh, it's hard being an artist in a, um, you know, a professional setting. We could all probably be artists and do oil paintings in a gallery or in a studio by ourselves and mm-hmm. kind of create stuff. But to be an artist, like, as a profession, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's difficult. And you have to, on some level, you have to kind of check your ego at the door because it's not all about you. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you, you're asked to provide visuals because they saw something in your portfolio or online or something that they liked about it. So mm-hmm. you kind of have to operate on both those levels. Um, but um but yeah, you kind of have to just know that it's it's going to be challenging. It's not going to always be about you, that you're working in a full collaborative effort. And you guys mm-hmm. got to figure out how to all 
get to that finish line together. Um, mm. Yeah, that's about it. Try to have James. fun. Awesome. Thanks so much. It was absolutely honor chatting with you. Thanks for jumping on. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, look forward to seeing it posted online. Awesome. A huge thanks to James for sharing his experiences and for some profound advice. Hit the links to see what James is up to and give him a follow too. Then head to LearnSquare.com and check out the plethora of creative workflows you can unlock for your own projects. Remember, all of our first lessons are free. I've been your host, Aaron Danda. Till next time.